So what we know for sure is that acceptance has to be communicated. It has to be communicated in any case. It doesn't matter whether, as we just saw, acceptance is communicated in writing or whether that is done orally or even by conduct. That doesn't matter at all, as long as it is communicated. So that then begs the question of what happens if acceptance is communicated by silence. Is that possible? Can you communicate by silence? And this question arose very prominently in the case of Felthaus and Bindley. Felthaus and Bindley involves an uncle and a nephew, the Felthauses. And what happened in that case is that the uncle, who lived in London, was interested in buying a horse from his nephew. And the nephew was a horse breeder. And the uncle and the nephew had had discussions about the possibility of such a sale. And the uncle put forward an offer, and the offer included all the necessary details and it also included a proviso as to how acceptance was going to occur namely and this is not verbatim what you see there on the screen but in, in essence this is what the uncle said if I do not hear from you the horse is mine so in essence the uncle was instructing the nephew so the offeror was instructing the offeree that if the offeror doesn't hear from the offeree the contract is complete, it is fully formed, and therefore the acceptance has been communicated effectively just by remaining silent. Now, it's very important to note that there wasn't a disagreement between the uncle and the nephew. They were actually in agreement. They were in agreement about what the contract was for, obviously the parties, they were in agreement about the price, everything was certain. The only thing that was really missing was that neither of them actually ever said, I agree or I accept. That was never communicated. Well, they might have said it, but it certainly was not communicated to the other party. So ultimately, the nephew never replied to the uncle. But after all, the uncle's offer said, if I don't hear from you, we're good. The contract is complete and the horse is mine. Now, unfortunately, there was a mix up and the nephew didn't intend for this to happen, but the nephew had put the horse up for auction and then had miscommunicated to the auction house or in fact had communicated but somehow that message was lost that the horse was not going to be sold because after all the uncle had bought it or so the nephew believed. The auction house went ahead and sold the horse to a third party. Now that is due to that was due to a mix-up but the question that arose then was was there a valid contract between the nephew and the uncle in the first place? Which then, of course, has an impact on any subsequent agreement, such as the third party buying the horse at the auction house. Now, we don't need to concern ourselves with the subsequent agreements. That's really a matter of tort law. However, we do need to concern ourselves with whether the initial contract was formed or whether it was not formed. And so the court looked at the clause or the proviso, the stipulation made by the uncle, that silence was acceptance. And the court held that silence can never be acceptance. So you can never ever, as an offeror, say, if I don't hear from you, we have a contract. That simply won't stand. So in any case, you, as an offeree, will have to communicate acceptance in one of the ways that we already discussed. So here are a number of examples from that case of what does not amount to acceptance. Where a person writes an acceptance on a piece of paper which he simply keeps. So let's say the nephew had written down on a piece of paper, I accept my uncle's offer and I'm going to sell him the horse. And then he would have, what if he had just kept the paper? Perhaps he forgot to send it off or send it back. Well, that's not acceptance because it hasn't been, it has been written down but it has not been communicated. Also, where a company resolves to accept an application for shares but does not communicate the resolution to the applicant. So, even though a company has agreed to go ahead with a contract but has not communicated with their contracting partner, again, no acceptance. Where a person decides to accept an offer to sell some goods and instructs his bank to pay the offeror, but neither he nor the bank gives notice of this fact to the offeror. So again, there seems to be agreement but there is lack of of communication as to the acceptance and where a person communicates his acceptance only to his own agent so it is possible as we shall also see in a few moments to authorize someone to act on your behalf 
But if that person then doesn't do what you tell them to do, namely communicate acceptance, then there is no contract. So merely communicating it to your agent is not enough. In any case, you have to communicate acceptance to the offer role. That is absolutely certain. And so in every situation that you may be confronted with, always look as to not only whether there was acceptance expressed in some way, but also whether that was then communicated to the offer all. So effectively what was going on in Feldhaus and Bindley was that the uncle as the offeror had put forward the terms of how acceptance may occur, namely by silence. And so as we found out, that is not allowable. However, in general, it is possible to communicate acceptance without actual communication between the parties taking place. But that's not the same as silence. So recall the case of Carlyle and the Carbolic Smokeball Company. The Carbolic Smokeball Company had put out their ad and had stated in its ad what the person who reads the ad and takes the medication, the smoke ball, what it is they need to do. So they need to buy the smoke balls, they need to take them a certain amount each day, do that for two weeks, and then they also need to get ill in order to claim the reward. So all these things had to happen in order for there to be acceptance of the offer. In other words, what the Carbolic Smoke Ball Company actually did is they let the offeree know, any potential offeree, anyone who saw the ad, what is it that you need to do in order to accept the offer? So technically, Miss Carlyle did not communicate with the Carbolic Smoke Ball Company. She did not call them up and say, okay, I bought your drugs, I'm going to take them now and we'll see what happens. Nothing like that happened. However, there was conduct. She wasn't just silent. She did something. She went to the shop. She bought the drugs. She took the drugs. All of these things happened. So the case really emphasizes that where someone lays out how you accept and where that is not mere silence, where it is actually going out and doing something, that can amount to acceptance. So actually going out and buying the smoke bowls and taking them and so on and so forth amounted to acceptance. Now, as I alluded to a few moments ago, it is absolutely possible that as an offeree, you appoint someone to accept or communicate the acceptance on your behalf. That is absolutely allowable. It's just that you have to make sure that your authorized agent actually does what you tell them to do and does communicate acceptance. Now, the important part is that whoever it is who communicates acceptance has to be duly authorized to do so. It's simple where a contract only involves two parties, offer or an offeree. So where the offeree, either in person or by post or by conduct in some way, accepts the contract is fully formed. It's a bit more difficult where the offeree is a larger group of people. And so this happened in the case of Powell and Lee. Mr. Powell had applied um, for the position of a headmaster. And technically, his application was in the form of an offer. Now, the school management, comprising of a number of people, talked about this and agreed to employ him. So you could say that the contract was then formed. However, what was missing was that the decision to appoint him to accept had never been communicated to him. Not at that point, not yet. So the contract was not fully formed. Now, one of the school managers approached Mr. Powell and told him, you got the job, congratulations. So, in essence, Mr. Powell felt as if acceptance had been communicated. The problem was that this one person, this one school manager, hadn't been authorized to speak on behalf of the whole group. And as it turns out, unfortunately for Mr. Powell, the school management decided to employ someone else. So Mr. Powell sued, but he failed because the court said that he had never received acceptance, it had never been communicated to him, because the person who had communicated acceptance to him wasn't authorized, so that wasn't valid, and in essence, because the school management as a whole, or as an authorized person acting on 
their behalf, had not communicated with Mr. Powell, had not communicated acceptance, he didn't get the job, the contract had not been formed. Let's have a look at some of the other rules relating to communication of acceptance. In Holwell Securities and Hughes, the offeror had stipulated as part of their offer how acceptance should be communicated and it had stated that acceptance must be received by the offeror. In other words, irrespective of whether the offeree communicates in writing or orally or by conduct, that information, that communication has to be received by the other party, by the offeror. And that was held to be perfectly allowable. So an offeror may prescribe the mode of communication. Now, once a mode of communication has been prescribed, can it be varied? Well, generally it can be varied. And if we look at Tin and Hoffman, we already discussed this case earlier. This was the case of the iron that was being sold and bought, but there was no contract because the offers had crossed each other and there was in fact no acceptance. That case also makes clear that it is possible as a general proposition to vary a prescribed form of acceptance, but the acceptance that is in fact used must be equally as fast or faster than the prescribed mode of acceptance. So if someone prescribes the mode of acceptance as having to be by post and instead you hand deliver and that is of course quicker than by post, then that is perfectly allowable. Unless of course the offeror says that whatever the prescribed mode of acceptance is, is the exclusive mode of acceptance. So if the offeror says you may only and exclusively communicate acceptance by post or by whatever it is, well then you are really as the offeree stuck with that. So if the offeror says this is the only way, then you are stuck with that way and as the offeree you got to do exactly what the offeror said. However, if the offeror prescribes a mode of acceptance but doesn't make it clear that that is the only way, then we look at the speed of communication. So then you can vary your mode of acceptance. You just have to make sure that it is at least as fast or faster than what has been prescribed. So when is a contract actually formed? That means at which precise point in time does it come into existence? Now for guidance on this question, we can look at the case of Antares and Miles Far East Corporation, a very famous case, which established something called the receipt rule. What does that mean? Well, the brief facts are that there were two companies involved here. One company was located in Holland, in Amsterdam, and the other company was located in the UK, in London. And the question wasn't whether there was a contract. That was clear. There was a contract. But once a dispute arose between the two parties, it was very important to figure out where was the contract formed, because the where then gave you the jurisdiction. That means wherever the contract was formed, that would be the jurisdiction in which any disputes would be adjudicated. And so what happened was that the Dutch company in Holland sent their acceptance by instantaneous communication, by which we mean things like telex, and fax and so on and so forth. And they contended that the contract was formed at the point in time when they sent that message and hence it would have been formed in Amsterdam in Holland. The British company said that the contract was formed in London once that communication was received and the court held that in fact the contract was formed at the place and at the time of receipt, this being London. So this is the general rule regarding acceptance and formation of contract, namely that once acceptance is received, the contract is formed. Now this is the general rule. It's called receipt rule.